All right, let's go ahead and get started. Let me get the sign-in sheet passed around. Let me sort of get back to, that's kind of where we were. Okay. All right, um, let me see. Okay, so I'm going to get the sign-in sheet passed around. Um, so I just gave you all back homework two that's been graded. You all did uh, pretty well. I don't really think there's any major comments that need to be made other than uh, we still had a couple uh, things with format. You know, make sure you're using quad paper. Uh, make sure that the original assignments, the cover sheet, uh, and whatnot. And there were still a couple folks that are using the international edition, which it's fine to have that, but there are differences in the problems. So make sure that you are that you are responsible. Uh, well, you are responsible. So make sure that all of your um, problems match. So one, two, three, four, five, six. There's that. Uh, one. Okay. All right. Um, in addition, is that one extra? But is anybody missing one? And that's where that went. Okay. Um, in addition, if you recall last time, I assigned homework three, but I forgot to bring hard copies, so I brought hard copies today. Um, keep in mind, this is due on Thursday, and there are no, I'm not going to accept any late submissions because I'm giving you a solution on the same day. So that way you have at least something to go off of for the exam coming up uh, on Tuesday. Sound fair? give you that. There's that. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's, that's right. I'm, I'm going to learn these, I promise. I promise I'm going to learn these. There's that. And then, oh, goodness. There's that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm going to very briefly go through the solution to homework, too. I mean, I don't think there's anything uh, significantly challenging about it. Um, so problem number one. Um, you know, uh, pretty straightforward. You can just sort of, uh, you know, you can cut a section to determine the stress in the copper bar and then use equilibrium to determine the resulting stress in the steel posts. And then from there, uh, delta equals PL over EA to get uh, everything else. Okay. Now, problem two, honestly, the, the way that the book went about it, um, I think this problem was probably a, a tad more confusing than it should have been. So I think we were pretty loose on, on grading it. Um, now, the way the book treated the problem is it treated the inner cable as a member and then the outer cables as a member and treated it as if it was a, a composite member and, and, and did the, uh, the same stuff it's done before. Um, personally, I think that's a bit much for a problem like this. Since everything's made out of steel, all the bars are going to be equally stressed uh, when they're subjected to this 9-kip load. So just put nine kips on it, calculate the stress, and then from there back calculate the load in each bar. I think that's a lot easier than what the book did. So hopefully that hint helped out uh, a little bit. Um, now problem three, this, oh, yes. I have a question. Uh, yes. How did they get their area? Oh, okay. All right, th okay. That, that, that was in the book, and I, and I mentioned that in the hint as well. This isn't a solid bar, it's a cable. So if you think about the geometry with a solid bar, and you know, imagine you know, lightsaber or samurai sword, a solid bar is literally just a single circle. But a cable is a series of wires that's twisted together. It's not going to have the same area as a circle. There was a table in the book that, that you were to use to determine the area of a cable. 
Okay, it's like, is it table 2-1 or something like that? Okay, if you go to the textbook and look at table 2-1, you know, right here, areas of cables that are listed. Okay. okay, it's because a cable technically has different properties than a solid bar. So if it was a solid bar, that's where that would have come from. All right, everybody good? All right, um, what was else? Number three. Number three was a statically indeterminate problem. It was externally indeterminate and was pretty similar to one I think we had uh, at least somewhat done in class. We're going to do a torsionally indeterminate problem today that's very similar to this one. In fact, it's almost plug and chug the same thing, only with numbers instead of symbols. And problem four just stretched those uh, calculus skills a little bit. You had to integrate that uh, temperature variation. Any questions? Everybody good? Okay. I have one thing I want to pass out. Let me preface this by saying this will not be on the exam, so don't worry. But I have a feeling, a, a, a hunch, that we're going to finish our torsion stuff at, with time to spare. So I at least want to let you all, or at least, I want you all to at least have the material for what's coming. But don't worry. What's in this packet will not be on the exam, so, so don't worry. Six. Six. Okay. Actually, I think you all might need one more. I think I miscounted that. Did I miscount that? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I stepped on your foot there. All right. So today what you all should have so that everybody's clear on what I handed out I handed out your homework 2 back to you with a solution I handed you out a hard copy of homework 3 and then a, a lecture sheet on geometric properties right everybody good in addition this is something I like to do when the exams are coming around so I probably should have waited because I uh, I passed the signage where's the signage sheet okay well let me borrow that. I'm going to pass it around again. I, I, my coffee hasn't kicked in this morning. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to put the sign-in sheet in this notebook. This notebook contains every handout that I've given out this semester. Okay. So you should have everything because I think on day one I kind of dispersed everything out. But in case you're missing a homework solution or something, I'm going to pass this around. If you would, just take a quick peek through it. If there's something you're missing, you know, let me know. Just put here on the side next to your name, I'm missing the torsion booklet or whatever. And I'll try and bring it next time. Sound good? All right. So there's that. I'm going to go ahead and pass that around. All right. So any questions? Now, one last um, you know, thing I'll do before we get back into the lecture and get back into the topics. You all do have a homework assignment due on Thursday. Does anybody have any questions about it? Y'all remember you have a homework assignment due on Thursday, right? Oh, okay. You gave, you gave me this deer in the headlights look there. <laughs> yes, sir. For the third problem, we don't have to do anything. We just have to ignore part two. No, 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 no. no. Uh, funny. <laughs> funny. Not, funny guy. No, just on problem three, do parts A and B. No C. Part C isn't anything of, in all seriousness, part C isn't really anything that's complex, but you're going to spend... Ten, you know, you're going to spend 10 or 15 minutes thinking about it, and it takes 10 or 15 seconds to calculate. It's, it's, it's no big deal. You're just taking the load over the angle of twist to get a stiffness calculation. It, it's not really critical for, for that type of problem, so I'm, I'm just not worried about it. All right. Funny guy. All right. Any questions at all on the homework? Okay. Again, remember, it's due on Thursday uh, when we come in. You turn in the homework, I'm giving you a solution. We'll go through the exam, and then it's question time. So on Thursday, be prepared to come in and ask whatever you want, okay? Ask whatever questions you want. Now, you can ask what's on problem one. I won't answer it, but um, that was a joke, not a very funny one. It must be too early. Now, you can, I'll answer what I can, but um, I, won't, uh, I won't just tell you what's on the exam. But I'll do my best to try and review stuff. Okay, any questions? So with that, let's sort of get jump right back into it. So if you recall, we've been talking about torsion for the past little bit, and I think the last time that we, or the last time we, we talked about this, 
you know, we had sort of derived our fundamental torsion equations. We've already uh, sort of uh, taken care of that. So we know that the angle of twist is TL over GJ, or if we have to integrate, um, we know what J is and how to compute it for a solid circular shaft or a pipe. Um, we know how to calculate maximum shear stresses and resulting maximum shear strains. Um, again, we don't need to integrate if we've got a constant T or a constant J. We can just say TL over GJ. And then we know how to calculate G given other material characteristics, such as uh, Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio. Now, we did a couple examples with uh, torsion, and then we started to go into power-torque relationships, you know, to try and using shafts to transmit power. You know, how, how can we, you know, size uh, uh, circular shafts for this very, uh, this very task? And a lot of this was really, I mean, it was pretty simple. I think what was probably the most complicated thing was the units. You know, that's really what was kind of tough, just making sure that, you know, how do you go from a horsepower to a foot-pounds, you know, in a power-torque relationship. So other than that, I think it was pretty straightforward. Now, we did this example looking at uh, essentially a design problem, sizing the shaft for a particular uh, power transmittal. We're looking at 30 horsepower, and we looked at the allowable stress in the steel, and we used that to size the shaft. Okay, and that's sort of where we left off. So, any questions? Okay. Now, what we're going to talk about today is torsional indeterminacy. That is a mouthful. Um, but what you're going to find are these torsion problems, these indeterminate torsion problems, are a lot like axially loaded indeterminate members. I mean a lot like it. Okay. Um, our strategy is going to be fairly similar. And the, the math that we do is really going to be similar. The only thing that we have to recognize is the mechanics. Okay? For instance, let's take a look at the, uh, the following example. So we've got a, a member that is a composite shaft. And we've dealt with problems like this before in axial loads. We had composite columns. Okay? Now remember, we took a composite column. Let's go back to the axially loaded members. So we took a column. I think we had something like a brass cord. And it was surrounded by aluminum and we pressed on it, okay? Now that was an indeterminate problem because we had one equation, the sum of forces in that direction had to equal zero, but we had two unknowns. We had the force in the brass core, and then we had the force in the aluminum. So we had two unknowns. So we said, well, well how are we gonna solve this? And then that's where we use those compatibility relationships. The idea that if I take this column and I press on it, the aluminum and the brass, they both compress the same amount. The deflection was equal, okay? Now what I'm going to do is instead of taking that column and pressing on it with this example, I'm taking that column and I'm twisting it. So I'm taking it and I'm going like this. So I propose to you that instead of the amount of stretch being equal, I propose to you that phi, that angle of twist, is going to be equal. Now if I grab that column with one end and I go like that, however much the, uh, what is it? the aluminum rotates, the steel is going to rotate the same amount. So the phi for the aluminum is going to equal the phi for the steel. Beyond that, it's almost exactly the same problem. So I think this is going to be kind of old hat. So we have a 2.5 inch diameter composite shaft, and it's made of a 2 inch diameter solid aluminum uh, core or solid aluminum shaft surrounded by steel. So we have a steel pipe surrounding an aluminum core, okay? Which in torsion kind of makes more sense. You know, in torsion, um, the higher stresses are on the outside. So if the higher stresses are on the outside, you want the stronger material on the outside. Steel's tougher than aluminum, so we want that on the outside. Um, let me get some of this out of your way. Well, actually, some of this is yours, so. Yeah, and then one of each. All right. Okay. Now, we've got a torque of 14,000 inch-pounds that's been applied to the composite section, and I want to determine the extreme fiber stress in the two materials. So, sound good? All right. All right. So we got example, what is this, 14? Okay. So let's start off listing some given parameters. Okay. Now let's also recognize that we've got 
I mean, how do we calculate the angle of twist if you've got a solid, you know, a, a solid shaft where we have a constant T and a constant J? It's T L over G J, right? So far so good? All right, so let's see what we know, okay? Do we know the torque? Yeah, it's what, 14,000 inch pounds or the applied torsion. All right, now what's interesting, do we know the length? No, we don't, we do not know the length, okay? So the length is unknown what we're going to find is that it doesn't matter, okay? And you'll see why here in a second. Okay. Now, we've got two materials, right? Aluminum and steel, okay? Now, before I, I go into the aluminum properties and the steel properties, so we're going to have aluminum properties and we're going to have steel properties, let's recall what this shaft looks like. So, here's the shaft, and then there's a core. All right, that's about the best you're going to get. All right, so this inner core, bless you, this inner core is aluminum, and this is steel. All right, now this is, what, two inches? And this is, what, 2.5? I do that right? All right, so let's deal with the aluminum first, okay? What is the G value for the aluminum? And everything seems to be in pounds and inches, so let's just leave that in PSI. Now, J, how am I going to compute J for the aluminum? Nope, pi over, you're close, pi over 32 times d, d to the fourth, okay, so that's pi over 32, bless you, times 2 inches raised to the fourth, and that comes out to be what? Whew. I, okay, pi over 2, so that comes out to be 1.571. All right. Now, for the steel, G is, what is that, 12 times 10 to the 6 PSI? All right. Okay. All right. So, J is, how do we calculate J? There we go. The outside of the fourth minus the inside, right? So, pi over 32, was that uh, 2.5 to the fourth minus 2 to the fourth. Bless you. All right, so that comes out to be what? Two point two six what four yeah. inches to the fourth. All right, so far so good. Any questions? Okay. All right, so let's think about our what we're going to need to do for this problem. So I'm taking this shaft and I'm twisting it. So I am applying some torque, some 14,000 pounds, okay? I propose that that torque is being resisted by the shaft, but it's being resisted by the aluminum part and by the steel part. So I propose that we have one equation of equilibrium. So if I look at uh, equilibrium, 
or the sum of torques equaling zero, I have to recognize that whatever that applied torque is, it's got to equal the resulting torque in the aluminum plus the resulting torque in the steel. In other words, we're applying a torque of, what, 14,000 inch-pounds? Some of that's going to go to the aluminum, some of that's going to go to the steel. I don't know how much, but I know that whatever those two add up, it's add up to be, it's got to be 14,000. All right. Make sense? All right. So that's my equation of equilibrium. Okay. My equation of compatibility is what? So let's see. Compatibility. Exactly. So in other words, the angle of twist for the aluminum has got to equal the angle of twist for the steel. All right. So now we've got two equations, two unknowns, and we can go through and solve. All right. So we'll say this is equation one, this is equation two. All right. Any questions? All right, do you all need a minute, or you want me to go ahead and go on to the next one? Okay, all right. Okay, let's take that second equation and let's expand it a little bit. So expanding two. So that's what? Phi of the aluminum is phi of the steel. So far so good? Okay, so how do we calculate phi? Well, it's TL over GJ, right? So it's the torque of the aluminum times, we'll say the length of the aluminum, but we're going to see what happens to that here in a second. The G of the aluminum plus, or not plus, times the J of the aluminum has got to equal the torque in the steel, the length of the steel, the G for the steel, and the J for the steel. So far, so good? Okay. Anybody see anything I can do to that equation? I, the lengths will cancel out because the length of the aluminum is equal to the length of the steel. So right there, I can cancel that out. So remember, we weren't given a length for this shaft. Does it matter? No. Okay. So what I propose then is that T aluminum divided by, and I'm going to write this a little short. I'm going to say... GJ for the aluminum has got to equal the torque for the steel divided by the GJ for the steel. All right, so far, so good? Now, let's go back to equation one. All right. Okay, what's equation one state? That whatever that torque is, it's got to be equal to the torque of the aluminum plus the torque of the steel, right? So the torque in the aluminum plus the torque in the steel. So would you agree then that if I wanted to solve for, say, the torque in the steel, it would be whatever that applied torque is minus the torque in the aluminum. Would you agree with that? Fair point. So why don't I plug in? What do you think? Now look at that equation. What's the one value we don't know? TAL, the, the torque in the aluminum. Because we know the GJ for each material, and we know the applied torque. It's 14,000 inch-pounds. So all we got to do is solve for TAL. So now this becomes a little bit of alphabet soup. So what do I do? I can take this... Uh, this denominator, flip and multiply, you know, put that over there. So what do I got? I've got torque of the aluminum times, actually, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. What do I got? I got GJ for the steel, and then GJ for the aluminum is torque minus 
torque of the aluminum, all right? And then if I sort of carry that up there, what do I have? I can add the aluminum over to the left side, so I can say torque of the aluminum, what is that, G, J, steel, G, J, aluminum, plus torque in the aluminum is the torque. So here, I just took that and multiplied it up, and then added the aluminum over on the other side. I'm going to factor out the torque in the aluminum. So it's GJ for the steel divided by GJ in the aluminum plus 1, right, equals the torque. So if I want to determine this torque in the aluminum, just take torque and divide it by all that, right, that big chunk inside there. Sound good? All right, you want me to hold this up here for a second? Okay, not sure, no problem. Any questions? All right. So if I want to solve, again, if I want to solve for the torque in the aluminum, just divide the torque divided by everything in the brackets, right? So I'm going to go on to the next panel. So, so therefore, the torque in the aluminum is, what is that? It's um, actually, I don't need the brackets anymore. It's what? Oh, goodness. Start over. Clean that up. So we've got GJ for the steel divided by GJ for the aluminum plus 1 all under the torque, right? I did that right? So let's see if we can figure that out. So on the bottom, we've got, you know, first off, we've got to deal with this fraction right here. So what was GJ for the steel? G was what? 12 times 10 to the 6 PSI. And then J, what was J? Well, no, that was for, that was for the aluminum. I'm talking about J. 2.264, yeah. 2.264 inches to the 4th. And then for the aluminum, 4 times 10 to the 6 PSI. So that's where that came in. And then the J was what? 1.2. What was it? There we go. Five, five, seven inches to the fourth plus one. And then that was fourteen thousand inch pounds. So let's think about our units. Does what going is what bleh, is what is going on on the bottom of that fraction. Does that make sense? We have PSI times inches to the fourth over PSI times inches to the fourth. So everything in that fraction cancels. So it's unitless plus one. So on the bottom there's no units and it's just inch pounds over that. So that makes sense. All right? Anybody got an answer? I know, okay, you got 3236. Okay, okay, we, you said 4630? 
2630 and you got 2630 yeah I, I have 2630 do this do do just everything on the bottom first and then just take like 14,000 divided by the answer because that can it, doing it all at once I know you can have parentheses all over the place oh well <laughs> that'll do it that'll do it <laughs> what's that I got 2629 okay all right I think we got enough seconds on that one. So 26, 29.5. Okay. <laughs> we'll say we'll, we'll say this. 26, 29.9 inch pounds. Oh. Inch pounds. Okay. So help help me out with this. So if the torque in the aluminum is 26, 29.9 inch pounds, what's the torque in the steel? 14,000 minus that. So tell me, what does that come out to be? Three hundred and seven, seven zero. Okay. All right. Sound good? All right. I'll tell you an interesting fact about um, mechanics, um, and this is th this is something I haven't really shared with you before, but this is a really good point to, to share it. When you're dealing with an indeterminate problem like this, and, and you know, make sure we're all clear, this is indeterminate, right? Remember, there were too many unknowns, and there were equations of equilibrium. When you're dealing with problems like that. Now this, this comes out. When you're dealing with problems like that, stiffness acts a whole lot like a magnet. Okay. What I mean by that is, let's look at these two. Let, let's look at this composite shaft. There was an aluminum core and a solid steel shaft surrounding it. Now let's take a look at these numbers. Let's go back back to this. Okay. All right. So I want to look at these numbers. Let's look at the aluminum. Okay. So we had a G of 4 times 10 to the 6 PSI, and we had a J of 1.571. The steel, 12 times 10 to the 6 PSI, 2.26 inches to the fourth. Everybody seen that? The steel is much more stiff than the aluminum. In other words, it has a stronger resistance to deformation than the aluminum. If I take the same load and put it on the aluminum versus the steel, the aluminum is going to be easier to deform. Make sense? Okay. Well. By that very nature, the fact that the steel is much more stiff, stiffness is like a magnet. Because the steel is stiffer, it attracted more of that load. I mean, look what happened at the end. All right, When we went through and did the grunt work, we found that the steel carries much more torque in that shaft than the aluminum does. Make sense? And that'll always happen. Stiffness is like a magnet. It, ha it has a way of just sucking in all of the load. Okay, does that make sense? That that that's just a a, a fact of mechanics that you kind of uh, get used to. But this is actually sort of a good thing in terms of design. Remember, the steel is the stronger material, so it almost you know we'd almost want it to experience more of the torque. All right, so far so good. Okay, now are we done? No, we've got to determine the stress. So. We have to determine tau max, so I'll say shear stress or maximum shear stress. In other words, TR over J. Now, for the aluminum, I'll say the R for the aluminum is what one inch right in it because it's two inch core and R for the steel is one point what two five so help me out if you if we know if we now know the torques in each segment we know the radius in each segment and we know the J in each segment TR over J you tell me what's the maximum shear stresses so plug and chug you tell me what is the maximum shear stress in the aluminum and what is the maximum shear stress in the steel? Mm. 
We can just do it to the nearest PSI. Just keep it simple. One six seven four. Anybody else get that? Okay. That's PSI. And what about for the steel? Bless you. Sixty-two seventy-seven. Sixty-two seventy-eight. Oh, I'm getting it backwards. Sixty-two seventy-eight. Sound good? All right, there we go. Any questions? And that, that concept that stiffness is a magnet, it applies across the board. I mean, it applies in mechanical engineering. It also applies in civil engineering. For instance, if you've got a bridge uh, and, you, and the bridge is a continuous span, you know, you've got the bridge and then there's piers in the middle. You all have seen that on the interstate probably all the time. A lot of times the, uh, the, the portions of the beams around the piers, particularly if we're talking about steel bridges, they tend to incorporate larger flanges and larger web sizes. And when that happens, the larger those flange sizes get, the larger the moments and shears are. They sort of just get sucked into to the pier region. So pier regions tend to take a little bit of special attention when you're designing a bridge. So, but there's other reasons for that. And that's a, another story for another day. We haven't even talked about beams in here yet. But believe me, we will. All right. Any questions? OK. Now this one is. Similar to your homework problem that you had uh, not too long ago. Uh, in other words, um, what we've got is a, uh, um, an externally indeterminate structure. Uh, now, it's made of different materials just to throw a little bit of, of a kink into the mix. But the fact that it's made of different materials doesn't, is not what makes it indeterminate. In other words, if support B was gone, and I still had two different materials, it would still be determinate because I could just literally add up the angles of twist. That the total angle of twist is the angle of twist of segment one plus the angle of twist of segment two. So <coughs> pretty straightforward. All right, but because I've got that, that wall uh, or the wall on both sides, it's uh, indeterminate. So I've got this uh, shaft. It's supported by two rigid walls. And I'm taking and I'm applying a torque there at that point C. And that torque is 10,000 inch pounds. So I've got shaft A is made out of steel, so it's got 12 times 10 to the 6 PSI, a diameter of 2 inches and a length of 3 feet. And then shaft B is aluminum. There's the G value. It's a diameter of 3 inches, and it's a length of 6 feet. Okay. So <coughs> these are solid circular shafts, so we don't need any inner diameters or wall thicknesses or anything like that. So we're going to determine the maximum shear stress overall. Not too bad, right? Okay. So this should be pretty straightforward. I, I don't, I'm not going to rush through the problem, but I, I think it should be pretty, uh, pretty reasonable. OK. Move this out of the way. OK. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Example 15. So let's take each shaft one at a time, and let's, um, let's write down some information. So let's say parameters. All right. So let's start off with shaft AC. OK. So what's the G value for shaft AC? There we go. Making sure y'all are awake. Now, what is the diameter? Two inches. Two inches. So if I have the diameter, what can I go ahead and compute? Well, we can, you're right. We can't compute the area, but do we need it? We need J. So. That comes out to be 1.571 again. OK. Now we have a length of that shaft too, don't we? Three feet. 
go ahead and convert that right off the bat. Reduce the confusion. All right, shaft CB. All right, <coughs> excuse me. Do we know G? All right. We have a diameter of what, three inches? So we can go ahead and compute J. Say it again. We have a length, right? 6 feet, right? All right. So far so good? All right. Any questions? Okay, so right off the bat, let, let's sort of recognize what's going on with the problem, okay? In other words, let's look at equilibrium. Excuse me. All right, so here's point A, here's point C, here's point B. And I'm taking this and I'm applying some torque, right? Some torque, T naught, okay? And if I take that point and I twist it, right? I take that point and I yank on it or, or twist it like so. I'm going to get some torque developing over here and some torque developing over here, right? So we'll say... Excuse me. Some torque A, some torque B, right? Would you agree then that if I say that the sum of torques has to be equal to zero, that whatever that applied torque has to be, or whatever it is, it's got to equal T A plus T B. So far, so good. Now, unlike last, uh, now, now, or just like last time, I should say. Um, now I've got, what, 10,000 inch-pounds? I know that some of it goes here and some of it goes here. I just don't know how much. But unlike last time, I'm not dealing with a composite shaft. I'm dealing with an externally indeterminate structure. So our strategy for an externally indeterminate structure is to assume one of these supports is free. So in other words, let's assume support B is gone. So knock that out of the way. So imagine that doesn't exist. If I take this point and go like that, or, or, you know, go like that. If I do that, this point B is going to rotate, right? Make sense? What I then need to figure out is what torque will then cause it to rotate in the opposite direction, and that's TB. Make sense? Okay. So, um, let me go ahead and go on to the next panels. Everybody got this? All right. So, we'll say... Case one, assume is free. So for case one, I'm going to assume that, that torque or that, that, uh, that support at B is gone. And I'm going to take this torque and I'm going to apply that right there. So that's T naught. Okay? So far so good? So I propose that I'm going to get some rotation here and the idea is to figure out phi at B is what? Let's see if we can figure that out. Okay. Now first off, would you agree then that if I apply a torque, I'm going to get a resisting torque right here? Right? And for this case, equilibrium tells me that that's got to be equal and opposite. So far, so good? All right. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the angle of twist in, um, you know, at the very end. In order to do that, I need the torques inside each segment. If you want kind of a, an analogy, what we just did are the support reactions. Now we've got to find the forces inside each member. It's kind of like a truss. You know, you find the uh, reactions and then you find the forces in each member. We're going to kind of do the same thing. Now the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to cut sections. So I'm going to cut, you know, section one right through here. We'll say cut section two right through here. Now, you all know how this goes. You can cut a section, look to the left, cut a section, look to the right. It doesn't matter. You're going to get the same answer. So let's be systematic. Let's just cut sections and look to the left. So for section one, I've got, what do I have? I've got a segment like this. I've got a reaction. This is torque, you know, T sub naught. I've got this shaft. And then that's where I cut the shape. Okay, I propose that inside that shaft we have to develop some torque. I'll call this T, what is that, AC? Torque inside AC. So if I, sum, uh, if I sum torques, I recognize that TAC has got to equal T naught in that direction. Fair point? Okay, if I look at section 2, 2, what do I have? There's going to be some unknown torque inside here. We'll call that TCB. I've got, I've got that, and then I've got that. This is T naught. And this is T naught. So if I sum torques, what is T uh, C B going to equal? You tell me. Zero. Exactly. All right. So far, so good. Now, why does this matter? Okay. That angle of rotation at B. Or maybe I should write it, maybe I should be more standard and say the angle of rotation from A to B. I propose that that equals the angle of rotation from A to C plus the angle of rotation from C to B. So that's going to be TL over GJ for the first segment plus TL over GJ for the second segment. So T, A, C, L, A, C, G, A, C, J, A, C plus T C B L L C B G C B J C B. All right. Sound good? What can I do with one of these terms, one of these fractions? One of them zero. This one over here on the right is zero because There's no torque. Sound good? So now it's time to plug and chug. So equals. So what was TAC? It was T naught. And what was T naught? 10,000. What was the length? So units. 36 inches. There we go. And then G was, was that the steel shaft or the aluminum shaft? Alright, so what was the G for? 12? And then what, 1.571? Sound good? So that angle of rotation came out to be what? First off, what's the units if we just calculate that directly? Radians. So whatever we get's in radians. 
Now let's leave it in radians because ultimately we're going to back calculate uh, where we're going to take this value and plug it back in. So this angle of rotation right now isn't really that important to us because um, <coughs> first off it doesn't really exist. You know, really the angle of rotation there is zero. So. 0 0.019 what? No, 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 no. Give me, give me one more. 191? Radians. All right. Everybody okay on that? Okay. So let me be clear. This is case one only. In other words, remember case one, we assumed that support B was free. Okay. Now another thing maybe what I also should do is indicate that that's rotation that way. All right. Sound good? Any questions? Okay. So now what I have to do, I'm going to go ahead and go on to the next panel if everybody good. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, look at case two. Okay, and case two is, um, how do I want to describe this verbally? So, uh, applied torque at B that causes an angle of rotation of 0 0.0191 radians. In other words, what I've got is a situation that looks like this. All right, so here's my shaft. Okay, I'm now going to apply some torque here going this way. Okay, all right, now I don't know the magnitude. All I know is that it causes an angle of rotation of 0 0.0191 radians. What I'm going to try and do is figure out what that torque is. Okay. Now let's use a little bit of equilibrium. Okay. Now, or one thing. One thing. I'm not including this as well. This is just the shaft by itself because the idea is I want to take these results and superimpose them onto the other one. So I've already accounted for that torque here once. I don't need to account for it again. I've only got that torque be uh, at the right end. So first off, sum of torques tells me that that reaction here is the same thing in the equal and opposite direction. Is everybody okay with that? So far so good? Okay. Just like before, two sections. So, section 1-1, one, one. I have that torque applied, and I'm looking for the torque in segment AC, and I propose that if you sum torques, you find that torque AC is TB acting that way in that direction. So far so good? Okay, what if I do segment 2-2? Two, two? Went to be an engineering major. Didn't think you'd be doing this much drawing, right? If I wanted to be an architect, I could be an architect. All right, and then we have TCB, right? So you tell me, sum of torques equals zero. TCB, what's that? It, no, is it? I, here's my free body diagram, just as like I had down before. If I have a torque going in this direction, I need a torque going in the opposite direction. So last time, I had a torque and it was zero. This isn't the case. Here, it's still TB going this way, all right? 
And I want to make sure that's clear, okay? Because if I go back before, I'm going to go back real quick. Before, I had a torque applied right here. So if I cut a section before and after, the section's changed, all right? Here, I've just got a torque going this way, so I've got to have a torque going in the opposite direction. On section 2, 2, I had T not going this way, T not going the other way. That's why this was zero. That isn't the case over here. On case 2, it's literally the same thing. But it's a different story. Make sense? Make sense? Everybody good? This is important. Okay. So, just like we did last time, we're going to try and compute the angle of twist. Okay? So we're going to do the angle of twist between A and B has to equal the angle of twist between A and C plus the angle of twist between C and B. However, we don't, um, we're not going to be able to compute that angle of twist directly because we don't know what the torque is. Okay? The torque is what we're going to be solving for. How are we going to solve for that? Well, I propose that adding these two values up, they better equal 0 0.0191 radians. <coughs> Make sense? In other words, removing that support B caused that point to rotate. Now I'm trying to figure out what will cause it to rotate in the opposite direction. So I know the angle of rotation. I'm trying to figure out the torque. All right? So plug and chug. What do we got? We've got torque AC, length AC, GAC, JAC, plus torque CB, length CB, GCB, JCB has got to equal 0 0.0191 radians. Now, are there any is there anything on these two fractions that are identical? The torques, they're equal, right? They're TB. So can I factor those out? And if you've got 2 times x plus 3 times x, factor out the x, right? Sound good? So I propose then that this is, you know, if this is TB, and this is TB, I propose then that we can say that torque B times L over GJ for AC plus L over GJ for CB has got to equal 0.0191 radians. And now look at this. What's the only quantity we don't know? TB, right? Any questions? All right. So if I don't know TB, I just take this point 0191 radians and divide it by all this pile of junk in between the parentheses, right? So 0 0.0191 divided by all that will give me my torque. So can I go on and go on to the next panel? Or? All right. All right, so therefore, so what is that? So we've got LAC over GAC, JAC plus G, C, B, oh, J, J, C, B, L, C, B, all under 0 0.0191 radians. Okay, plug and chug adventure. So what do we got? Let's start off here. So we've got... Let's see, GJ, what was that? G was 12 times 10 to the 6 PSI 
This was, what was that, 1.571 inches to the fourth. And then the length was 36 inches. I'm doing it a little backwards, but I just wanted the math to come out neat. All right, so this is 4 times 10 to the 6. This is 7.952. This was 72 inches. And this was 0 0.0191 radians. I know. It's a mouthful, but in the end, it is just plug and chug. Forty-five seventy-six. All right, that's what I got. Forty-five seventy-six inch pounds. So therefore, what's TA? Now you're on. You're on it. So what is that? Uh, Fifty-four twenty-four. All right, so segment A was just a little bit stiffer than segment B, so it accepted a little bit more load. All right, so are we done? No, because the problem asked for stress, right? So how do we calculate maximum shear stress? There we go. Tau max is T R over J, exactly right. So R for segment A, C is, is something, R for segment B, uh, C, B. So for segment A, C, the R was what? Well, if the diameter was two inches, that made that one inch. And that makes this what? What was it, 1.5? So, yes, TA, oh, this is, um, okay, to find TA, remember that tau A plus tau B had to equal 10,000 inch pounds. It was, in, yeah, inch pounds. So I just knew, remember, we didn't know what tau or TA or TB at the beginning was, but we knew that whatever they were, they had to add up to be the 10,000. So that's a good question. Yes, sir. Yes, so you don't use it again, exactly. If we put it there in, in, the, in case two, we would be double dipping. Does that make sense? All right, sound good? Okay, so here's my R for each segment. I know the T for each segment, and then we've, oh, we've got the J for each segment. J for AC was 1.571 and J for CB was 7.952. So, somebody help me out. What, was tau max, what, what will tau max then be for segment AC? And what will tau max for segment CB then equal? Thirty-four fifty-two. I got something different. What'd you get? 
right. I will take Ellsworth word for it. 3452. This nearest round number, PSI. And what what do we get right here? Wait, 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 wait. Ah, ah. Now I know why. Now I know why. Hold on, hold on. I'm getting ahead of myself. Can I go ahead and erase this down here? All right. Which torque did you use? The upper one, the 4576? You did. Uh, you used the 5424 for AC. Okay. All right. All right. Well, then, then okay. Then I will take your word for it. All right. So what what'd you get? 34.52 PSI. And what for the next one? I think I know what I did. I think I had a little just calculator error. What's the next one? 8.63. Okay. I think I know what I did. All right, so ultimately the actual maximum one, here's the maximum one, but any, either way, those are the answers. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, are there any questions? Okay, I still have a few minutes, so I at least want to talk about what's coming next. Um, Everybody good? Okay, that is exam one, right there, okay? So from here on, that's all exam two. So just so we're clear, in terms of bookkeeping, you all have a homework assignment that is due on Thursday. We will give you, a, I will give you a solution on Thursday, so no late work, and then we will have our exam review on Thursday, so we won't be lecturing, uh, if you will. Now I do want to at least talk about what comes next, just so you at least have an idea of the things to come. So what we're going to talk about next um, is the, uh, may not necessarily be a mechanics of deformable bodies topic per se, but it's definitely important to what we talk about, and that's looking at some geometric properties of areas, or bless you, uh, they might be called section properties. And, and first off, let's talk about why this is important, okay? So I've got here what I like to call the big four stress formulas. These are the most fundamental stress formulas that we will use in this course, okay? So you've already seen two of them. The fundamental formula for axial stress, P over A, and then torsional stress, TR over J. Both of those formulas are a function of section properties. For instance, P over A, the area, okay? TR over J, this torsional, uh, torsional modules, the St. Venant's, uh, uh, Venant's uh, modules. All right. We have sigma, uh, sigma bending, which is coming later, the bending stress formula, my over i, one of the most fundamental formulas in engineering. Okay? And it is a function of i, the moment of inertia. Okay? This value q for the shear formula is the first moment of area. These are all properties of an area. Take a, uh, a lightsaber or samurai sword, depending upon your preferences, cut through a member, you will see a shape. There are properties of that shape that are critical for design. We need the area for axial stress. We need the J for torsional stress. We already know that. So what we're going to do is take a little bit of time and go through properties of area. So some of this stuff you've already seen, I think, in some classes, like to calculate the area under the curve. Uh, you know, what we're doing is just summing up these differential elements, and you all know how to compute stuff like this. Um, the first thing we're going to review are centroids or centers of gravity, and you all have probably seen stuff like this before. Did y'all do this in statics? Maybe near the end and, you know, sort of really quickly brush through it. But we're going to take a little bit of time and do it here, and then we're going to discuss uh, things like the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia is, is fairly important because it's a representation numerically of bending stiffness. To give you kind of an idea, if you've got some floor system, why are the joists oriented like this as opposed to like this? It's because a board is stiffer in this direction than it is in that direction. Why? Because it has a higher moment of inertia in that direction than it does in the other. 
There's a reason why we do all of this, and that's what we're going to kind of try and illustrate. So we're going to spend some time talking about properties of areas before we get into bending. Bending is a, it will take a while to get through, so it's all exam two. So I just wanted to give you a taste of things to come. We're not going to talk about this for a while, so I thought it was pertinent to at least show you what's going on, because we're actually not going to get into this until next Thursday, you know, because Thursday we have our review session, Tuesday we have our celebration of learning, and then we have... You know, we don't have exams in here. We have celebrations of learning. And then the next Thursday, we get back to materials. So it's going to be a while before we talk about this. So I thought it was pertinent to at least mention it. All right. Any questions? Okay. Thursday, homework's due. Be prepared to ask questions. I'll have a little review packet to give you, and we'll go through it. All right. Everybody good? That's all I got. I will see you all next time. Hold on. Let me pause this real quick, or I'm going to forget.